Hey now, brawlers, it's time for another Board Game Brawl review with Nick Minahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. Hey people, today we're going to take a look at The Others, Seven Sins from Cool Mini or Not and designer Eric Lang, who has gained quite a bit of notoriety in the last couple of years, especially from Cool Mini or Not. He did the game uh, Blood Rage, was the last really notable thing that he did, although he keeps pumping out games left and right. Uh, now what The Other Seven Sins is, is a uh, one versus all game. So one player is taking control of this evil uh, manifestation and avatar of sin in all of its underlings, minions, controllers, things like that, that are flooding into this city, and I think it's the near future, maybe the far future, I can't actually remember. Um, and the other players are cooperating together to stop that player. Uh, they work for an organization called Faith, who's it's just an acronym I can never remember, that um, is trying to put a stop to that. And they all have, some of them have supernatural power, some of them are just really powerful soldiers, things like that. They're all different roles, sort of like D&D style roles, like the shooter, the leader, so on and so forth. Uh, and basically you're just going through different scenarios, different missions, trying to complete your goals, and the sim player just wants to kill you a bunch of times. <laughs> so let me go ahead and give you a brief look at how the game is played, then we're going to come back, I'll let you know what I think. The Others, Seven Sins, is a one versus all game for up to five players. One player takes control of the embodiment of one of the seven deadly sins and their minions, while up to four other players are heroes of the organization Faith trying to put a stop to the evil. The heroes win by completing every mission on the storyboard in order. The Sins players win if she can kill enough heroes. At the beginning of the game, the heroes will have a full reserve of seven heroes and start off playing with three or four of them, depending on the number of players. Every time a hero dies, they can respawn as a hero from the reserve. If a hero dies and there are no longer any replacement heroes, the Sins player wins the game. The Sins player gets the most important setup to do. She will choose an avatar of Sin and take its board. There are two Sins in the core game, Pride and Sloth, with Pride being depicted here. The board tells you which miniatures to grab for your forces. The avatar itself, the abominations, and the controller, along with two stats. The combat rating is how many sin dice it gets to roll to attack, and the defense rating is how many hits must be done to it in, order, in one shot in order to kill it. The sin also has a global ability that is in effect the whole game. The sins player will also choose an acolyte with its miniatures, which also has a special ability. A set of sin cards of the correct type, which she'll shuffle to draw five of, and the apocalypse track, which starts at zero along with the apocalypse deck, just shuffled for now. Lastly, she gets a number of reaction tokens equal to the number of heroes in play. I'll explain those later. All the players need to agree on a story, either of terror, corruption, or redemption. These are not just thematic choices, they actually have gameplay consequences. They pivot the mission goals of the heroes in interesting ways, but they also mean that you're going to start off with a different storyboard. The storyboard has special rules for the Sins player, as well as mission goals for the heroes. They'll move down from tier to tier, sometimes having more than one option, until they complete the last mission and win the game. On the other side of the board is a map setup with different options for the Sins player. She'll take the appropriate tiles, lay them out, and populate them with appropriate tokens, abominations, and so on. For hero setup, each player takes control of one or more heroes. For one or two players, you'll have to run extra heroes, essentially. As stated before, you'll have a total reserve of seven, including however many you're actively controlling. They have different roles, leader, shooter, fixer, and bruiser. Each hero gets five wound markers, a corruption marker that starts in the one position of their track, and a special ability that emphasizes their role. Your player board depicts three stats, combat, skill, and defense. You also get two turn tokens and one city token. Finally, the upgrade deck will be shuffled and five cards will be laid out face up. When you start the game, the Sins player will first handle any beginning of round tasks, like putting out more hazard tokens. Then the heroes decide which one of them will go first. On your turn, you flip one of your turn tokens over to show that it's been used. Then you may move and take an action as part of flipping over that token, or vice versa. Movement is simply two spaces in any direction. Movement is very fluid in this game. For actions, you may choose to start a fight or cleanse an area. To fight, simply declare an attack against any enemy in your space for melee or at range for ranged attacks. Roll hero dice equal to your combat rating plus bonus dice for other heroes backing you up in your same area. 
while the Sins player simultaneously rolls combined dice for every monster in the space. Every fist for the heroes is a hit. Shields cancel out enemy hits. Skills don't do anything for combat. We'll get back to that. Counter corruption on the dice cancels incoming corruption, appropriately enough. And the faith symbols, which looks like the flaming sword, lets you immediately roll another die. And then, after all dice are rolled, you can make each faith die onto into another symbol of your choice. The sins player's dice let him give corruption or deal physical wounds, and they also have blank faces as well. Heroes may optionally choose to take one corruption voluntarily whenever they're making an attack or a cleanse, which we haven't explained yet. If they do this, they move up one on their corruption track, then gain every bonus depicted at and before that spot. If you max out on corruption, you can't willingly take more, and then every point that you take unwillingly from the Sins player will deal a physical wound to you. This can have even more serious ramifications if you're playing a corruption story game. Also, wounds you take cover up the bonuses on the corruption tracks according to your preference as you take them. A hero can take five wounds and then is dead and must choose a new hero from the reserve. Instead of fighting, you can cleanse hazardous tokens from your area by rolling a number of dice equal to his skill bonus and then hoping for the skill icon to come up. For every one that he gets, he can remove a hazard token from his area. This, these tokens can cause fire damage, give bonuses to the Sins player's creatures, or even count as extra places for his creatures to spawn. You'll notice that these symbols are actually embedded in the tiles themselves in places. These cannot be removed, obviously, but the tokens can add more of them. At any point during his or her turn, a hero can use their city token in a district that they're currently in. Just put the token on the city space and activate each of the abilities indicated in an order of your choice. This can include healing, removing corruption, getting an extra turn token, moving the orbital satellite and then automatically killing a monster with it, or getting an upgrade card from the face-up stock. The Sins player does not actually have set turns. Rather, after a hero finishes their turn, she can use one of her reaction tokens to immediately make a reaction. This involves moving any single monster on the board and then attacking the hero whose turn just finished with every monster in that hero's space, even if none of them are the monster that they just moved. Combat works the same as when the hero initiates it, with the Sins player combining the attack power of every monster in the space. Also, the Sins player can play one Sin card per hero turn. That includes the reaction side of the turn. After every player has used all of their turn tokens, the Sins player has one more chance to react, and then the round ends. The storyboard will have the end of round stuff to do, which almost always involves raising the apocalypse track. When you do so, do what the track says, which might be drawing cards from the apocalypse deck. These cards, along with the other effects of the apocalypse track, indicate the escalating difficulty of the game. They could give inherent bonuses to your existing monsters, or they might even summon the vicious members of the Hellfire Club, which are really powerful monsters under the control of the Sins player. The Sins player then respawns monsters equal to the number of players, and also draws cards depending on the altar tokens on the board. Any altar token that is in a room without a hero enables the Sins player to draw one card, but if the heroes purposely move into rooms like that, they can block the Sins player from doing this. I'll lastly mention several of the features of the map. Some scenarios will require you to pick up innocent survivor tokens. There are NPC tokens which, when acquired, give you bonuses like extra movement, extra combat dice, and damage and corruption prevention. And there are metro stations where players can instantly move between two tokens of the same color. Keep playing until either the heroes meet all their goals or the Sins player kills enough heroes. Now, just a quick disclaimer here. Uh, many of you may have seen that I did an unboxing video because I had a huge Kickstarter pledge uh, for this game with tons and tons of expansions and content. This review is only for the core game. Um, a lot of the other expansions were other sins. There's um, Sloth and Prider in this box, as you saw in the overview. The other, a lot of the other expansions uh, have um, individual sins. And then there's more heroes that you can use. And there's the big Apocalypse box, which is probably the only other thing I'm actually going to uh, review at a certain point. But not in this um, game, in this review. Uh, so, the other seven sins. I am very conflicted about this game. I... <laughs> Which uh, makes for a more interesting review, I think, uh, rather than just, I love it or I hate it. It's it's actually, 
I like it, but I... Ah, okay, let's, let's just get into it. Let, let's start from the beginning. So, uh, theme of the game. I like the theme. Uh, this is... I, I would say that we're almost getting to the point where we're getting saturated with the sort of Shadowrun derivative sci-fi slash magic near future type thing. But we're not there yet. There's still something of a rarity. And I think it's handled well here. It's a very interesting theme. Um, although we're going to get back and touch on this in my uh, qualms with the game in a little bit. Um, I don't like the artwork style that much, although um, it is high quality. I can't say that it's not. And I wouldn't want this to be like comic book style necessarily. It's just I'm not a, a huge fan of this particular artist. But um, as far as the component quality goes, it's glorious because it's cool mini or not. They're awesome looking miniatures, very high quality. Um, everything, all the tiles and cards in the game are high quality. Um, one of my boards you might have saw in the overview has a scratch, but I don't even know if that was my fault or not. It's probably my fault. I'm pretty rough with my games. Um, so other than that, I think everything looks really good, and um, I think everything really brings the theme out as far as the artwork and presentation, even if I'm not a huge fan of the artist himself. Um, then moving on to the mechanisms. There's a lot of different things that I do like in the others. Um, I should say that I'm I have a proclivity towards one versus all games. Like, I like them. I did a whole top ten list of them because I think it's a very interesting concept, especially when it's not just, I'm the DM. It's Instead, it's like, no, I'm actively trying to kill all of you. I'm not trying to tell a story to you. I'm trying to win this game, too. And it's one of the reasons why Descent, even before they came out with the fully co-op version, was still a very good game for me because it's like, I'm going all out on this. Come at me. And so the others is like that as well. Uh, but in a lot of very different ways. And I would say that one of the faults of the game at first is that it starts to feel a little bit too much like zombie side in some places, like complicated zombie side. Um, but there's a, enough differences here that I think that, that that goes away pretty quickly. So with the heroes, abs absolutely the most notable thing is the corruption track. The special abilities that the characters get in their different classes actually aren't that tremendously different and um, particularly noteworthy, but the, uh, the the corruption track and how that works is very interesting to me. It's uh, a little bit of push your luck. It's a little bit of resource management because as you take wounds, they fill in the spots and uh, prevent you from getting those bonuses that you would want to get because it's a cascading effect, right? So the more corruption that you have, the more of those bonuses you're going to get when you when you take the corruption. But if you're taking wounds, you don't get those anymore. So that is perhaps the most unique mechanism in the game and the one that I enjoyed the most. And it works really well and it adds flavor to the characters that I think otherwise wouldn't be there. Uh, now on the part of the Sin player, it's a whole different thing. And this is why it's, you know, it's definitely asymmetrical and how everything works. It's not just, well, now it's my turn and I'm going to move these things around, these monsters. No, it's I've got my own deck of cards, which is, again, a callback to Descent in a way. Uh, I've got two decks of cards, really, and I've got um, a, a horde of monsters, three different types of monsters, plus acolytes, and plus, I, from my Apocalypse deck, I might summon the Hellfire Club, which is really a, a neat thing. And so you've got a lot of different options, things that might come out. I, we did play with a little bit of the expansion content. Um, I won't talk about it here, but um, that it's definitely opening the door for a lot more to be added, so it's worth noting. Um, so I, I really like that, and I just... Uh, there's a lot of interesting little things. So, for instance, the way that the... Um, blanking on the name for right now, but the tokens that... The, there's a the proper name for them. But the tokens that the Sin player can put out. Um, the map will start off with some, and then he gets to put some out. Depending on the scenario, he uh, gets to put some out in the rounds. Um, and then uh, the players have to be like... Have to avoid them, wonder which ones are there when they're hidden... And just deal with fire and new spawning nests and all these different things. Um, and then you can cleanse them as well. So that's um, a very simple thing that was added to the game. But I think it adds a lot to it though. And again, separates it from the pack of other games that fall into this genre. Either one versus all or cooperative fantasy or sci-fi. Um, definitely makes it feel a little, just a little bit more different. As well as all of the different features on the map. I think that sometimes the map can be neglected in games. That was actually the, the huge downfall of um, the uh, War Machine Hordes uh, cooperative game, which is uh, City of Iron, something like that. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name. Someone will remind me in the comments. But that one 
that one's huge failing was that the map was so dull and boring. But there's a lot of stuff going on in this map, and it also sets it apart from Zombie Side as well because I do that. So I still have some concerns that in parts it's a little bit too similar. But there's so many things going on. You're getting civilians that are giving you bonuses. You're taking the metro rail. The city feels more alive in this game than in other games that I've played where it's just like space to space and then I bust open a door maybe and that's it. (laughs) No, there's a lot going on here. And all of this does come at a a, a couple of uh, costs. One of the costs is that it's a very difficult game to learn for the first time, and there's little, there's tiny little things that you'll get caught up on. Now, eventually you get over that, and the game is not super difficult or complex. It's very intuitive in a lot of ways. But in the beginning, it's like, what? Oh, how does this work? Oh, wait, what does this do? And just tiny little details just keep piling up on each other. But that leads me into the main fault of the game. And again, I want to stress, I like the game overall, but I'm very conflicted about it. And because... This game, the, the word that popped into my head to, to uh, describe it was that it's very staccato. <laughs> Maybe I'm not using that right as a metaphor, but it means that there's no smoothness to this game. When you play, it's like, wait, stop. You know, the, the way that the Sin player works it, by interrupting and having uh, both reactions and then um, being able to play the cards, and it, while that's fine, it works well it just really messes with the game's rhythm. I would have really preferred there to be a set turn order. But again, this is sort of the cost of innovation because in order to have these unique things, in order to have the others be different from uh, its brethren, its colleagues, its peers, whatever you want to say, in the genre or the wide over scoping genre, it, it, they wanted to go with this. And I can appreciate that, but it just made the game feel very all over the place. It, it never felt very coherent. And one of the other big things that is that, that sort of is tied together with is while I like the theme of the game, this is what I was alluding to earlier, the story of the game is super weak. Now, what do I mean by that? The idea of the game is sound, but there's no, first off, there's no campaign mode, which kind of doesn't make sense. Maybe there is in some expansion content I didn't see. Um, but it, and yes, you can play mission to mission, but there's no overarching, cohesive thing that's going on. There doesn't feel like a progression. There doesn't, um, even within the context of just an individual game session, it's just, go here, do this, I'm killing you, I'm killing you as much as I possibly can. I actually like the idea of, we're trying to do missions, and we have this progression of missions, but the Sins player is just trying to kill us, but that comes at the cost of me not really giving a shit about what's happening in the story or the world. Which is a shame because all the assets are there. The interesting mechanisms, the great characters themselves, and the avatars and the the minions and the followers and all these, the spawns, all these different things. But it's in the service of just a very uneven journey through each game session. Just a singular game session that has a lot of theme and story to branch out, but is very self-contained and doesn't really go anywhere. I know that doesn't make a ton of sense, but that is the primary overarching thing that I felt after I got done playing the others. Kind of drowning out all the interesting mechanisms and things. That's what this ultimately felt like to me. A collection of interesting things and great components that left me a little hollow. So, I I don't know. It's maybe just I've played way too many of these, and it may be that this one just overstays this welcome just a little bit too much. Um, but I can't possibly say that it's a bad game. And I enjoyed most of my time with it, but I wasn't that excited to play it again. In fact, I determined to play it again and again so I could do the review. And I was just like, I I guess we will. Yeah, okay, let's do it. I wasn't excited to do it, which is a bad sign, I think. But I am eager to try some of the expansion content, and we'll see what happens with that. Uh, In the meantime, it's a very expensive game, and my recommendation to you is if you like this type of game, if you like the work of Eric Lang, if you like the fancy setting, if you like miniatures to paint, you probably already own this game, but you should definitely at least try it. It's, It's interesting, and it's worth a shot. Just manage expectations as to far as far as how deep and meaningful it is. Thanks for watching. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. And make sure to check out our sponsor, Board Game Bliss, where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world. BoardGameBliss.com. Thanks for your support.